Howdy, howdy, y'all. Sorry for the interruption, but I just wanted to give a big thanks to all of you that have subscribed. Hitting 100 subscribers honestly made my week. It's kind of surreal to think that it's officially been a month since I started posting, and I've already posted my 54th video. But um, yeah, I just wanted to give a big thank you to everyone that has stuck around, or will stick around, because it honestly means a lot to me to get to share my love of fanfic with all of y'all. Okay, sappy monologue officially over. Enjoy. Cheat code, support strategist, by my head in the clouds not coming down, read by rat overlord, chapter 43, expectations. Ochako felt disgusting. She was nauseous and it wasn't even from her quirk. No, it was because she was a terrible human being and felt like she was lying to everyone around her. She wasn't trying to. It wasn't like she was working with villains or anything, but, well, she must have done something to trick All Might into thinking that she was actually worthy of being his successor, or he wouldn't have offered her his quirk. The motion of the train should have been calming. Shinso was asleep next to her, slumped down in his seat as they made their way to Gunhead's agency. But Ochako just couldn't stop thinking that he would have been a much better holder of one for all than she would. Anyone in the class would have been a better choice because at least they were actually heroic. She had decided to become a hero simply to make money for God's sake. Her reasons for becoming a hero were inherently selfish, and for some reason she'd been an idiot and thought that she'd be able to get away with it. All Might, however, deserved a successor who was actually heroic, and not just some poor girl who wanted to be rich. As flattered as she was by the offer, Ochako knew that she didn't deserve to be the symbol of peace. And that was the crux of why she felt so terrible right now. All Might hadn't been trying to pressure her, she knew that, but he was the number one hero! She'd looked up to him her entire life, and here he was, giving her the opportunity of a lifetime, an offer that anyone and their dog would be ecstatic about getting. An offer that she would have been ecstatic about getting if she could just stop feeling like such an imposter. Receiving one for all was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and anyone would count themselves lucky to get offered a quirk with unimaginable power, especially from, objectively, the best hero to ever live. How was she supposed to just turn her nose up at that? She didn't want to look ungrateful or presumptuous, like she didn't need All Might's power. And he was the number one hero, so she couldn't just tell him he'd made a mistake in choosing her because he was the symbol of peace and she was just a first-year hero student with no idea what she was doing. All Might didn't make mistakes, and even if he did, she hadn't earned the right to call him out on them. All Might might have phrased that as a question, but... At the same time, it felt like an offer that she just couldn't refuse. Ochako hadn't known how to say no, so she hadn't. She vaguely remembered stuttering out an appropriately polite response, but everything had been happening too fast, and the only thing she could do was fall back on being polite to try and hide the way that she was panicking inside. One thing led to another, and before she was really able to process what was happening, All Might had given her a piece of his hair to eat, which was, oddly enough, one of the least weird parts of the entire experience. And then it was done. She had All Might's quirk. Ochako had spent every day just trying to keep her head above water. She had felt the unfamiliar power welling up in her a few times so far, but she'd shoved it down in panic every time. She didn't deserve one for all. She shouldn't have ever accepted it, but she just hadn't known what else to do, and now it was too late to take it back. Last night... She'd woken up in the middle of a panic attack and had half-drafted an email to All Might trying to convince him to take the quirk back before she'd realized that she didn't even know if that was possible, and, even if it was, she probably shouldn't be talking about one for all over email. She just didn't know what to do. So, instead, Wachako did the one thing that she could do and tried to ignore the whole thing. She'd left on her planned internship and tried to put the whole symbol of peace thing out of her mind, thinking that maybe if she put it off for long enough, it would stop feeling like she was a liar and a fake. It hadn't worked yet, but hey, All Might had chosen her because she refused to give up, so there was always hope for tomorrow, right? The train started slowing down, and Ochako shook Shinso awake. Hey, Shinso! It's our stop! Huh? Shinso blinked slowly and blearily sat up. Oh, uh, 
over here? Um, not quite, a chuckle giggled. We still have to walk to the agency. Awesome. Shinsa stretched and stood up, grabbing his duffel as the train came to a stop. Well, let's get going. Chaco grabbed her duffel, pushing down one for all again as it tried to rear its head again. Yeah, let's go be heroes! Edshot had said that since he mostly operated at night, there was no point in Shoto showing up until the evening. Instead of telling his father that, however, Shoto had packed up like normal, gotten out of the house as soon as he could, and put on a beanie so that he could head to Epper's murder alley. Alright, maybe it wasn't fair to call it her murder alley, considering that it was most likely Shigaraki who had done the murders, but it had a certain ring to it, and Epper had it scratched him when he told her the joke, so she probably thought it was funny too. His father would probably be furious to know that he was spending most afternoons in a grimy back alley playing space heater for an angry cat, especially since some of those days also included the company of a guy who had quite literally tried to kill All Might. But out of all the ways that he could rebel against the old man, Shoto thought this was probably one of the mildest, and it was the bastard's own fault for kicking him out in the first place. Plus, this way at least someone would get some good out of his fire quirk. Hey girl. Shoto smiled as he bent down and Epper immediately butted into his hand. I brought you some food today. Do you want it? Epper screamed at him like the answer should be obvious, which made Shoto laugh. Honestly, part of the reason he'd chosen Edshot out of all of his offers was because his patrol route cut fairly close to here, which meant that if he had any free time, he could drop by, and if he didn't, he was already familiar with a lot of the streets and shortcuts, so it wouldn't be as anxiety-inducing as going someplace completely new. The other major reason, of course, was that Edshot was the number five hero, which meant that Endeavor wouldn't be able to bully him into rescinding his offer just so that Shoto could be forced to intern with him. It was a win-win. He opened one of the cans of cat food that he stashed in his bag and smiled when Epper let him pet her while she was eating. Actually, a better way to put it was that she made him pet her, considering that every time he'd brought her food in the past, she wouldn't stop screaming at him until he did, but Shoto didn't mind. Honestly, it was more physical contact than he got at home, so he didn't really care if she was picky about it, and he liked to think that it was a sign that she trusted him, since he'd read that some animals didn't like to let others near them while they ate out of fear that their food would be stolen. Shoto had probably done way too much frantic googling about cats since the first time he'd come here, which would have led to very interesting search history if he hadn't deleted it, but he felt like he was at least a little more knowledgeable than he had been before. At least he knew that Epper wasn't going to kill him, probably, so that was good, and he knew enough to not accidentally kill her, which was even better. When she was done eating, Epper spent a few minutes just kneading at his leg before hopping up onto his shoulder and starting to lick at the nape of his neck, the only place his hair wasn't completely covered in a beanie. He wasn't quite sure why she always did that when he came by, but she got angry if he interrupted her, and he didn't really mind, so he just let her do her thing. Eventually, she hopped back down into his lap and purred while he pet her until the sun was ready to set and it was time to go to Edshot's agency. Isuku was fairly certain that he and Mei were the only two students, including the entire hero course, that had to take a plane to get to their internship. May had spent the whole flight rambling about how the plane worked and how well all the in-flight technology could be improved, much to the annoyance of their flight attendants, but Isuku just nodded along the whole time, making notes on any interesting quirks he found along the way to keep his brain and his analysis loose. Neither of them knew what to expect from Eye Island, but if May's fangirling was any indication, they were about to be put through the ringer, and he wanted to be as prepared as possible. The flight didn't feel long, but the sun was already almost setting by the time that they landed. Mei was bouncing with energy as she physically pulled Isuku from the plane, barely remembering to grab their carry-ons as Isuku laughed. <laughs> Don't forget we have checked baggage too, Mei-chan. Oh, I could never forget about that! Mei waved away his concerns. That's where my babies are! It's a shame that there are so many things they wouldn't allow on the plane. I could have been making so many cool babies to show all the big brain inventors this week! I'm fairly certain that's why they don't allow them, Isuku pointed out. 
You do have a habit of blowing things up when you're making babies, Mei Chung. He ignored the weird looks they got as they gathered their luggage, and he couldn't help but feel a sense of pride as he grabbed May's bag off the conveyor belt and only stumbled a little bit. Sure, May immediately took it from him and hoisted it onto the floor, no problem, but months ago, he wouldn't have even been able to lift it at all. He was getting stronger! It was only after they had had their bags and Isiku suddenly realized that they didn't know who was picking them up. Um... Mei-chan, did power loaders say who we were supposed to be looking for? Nope! Mei grinned and pointed at someone standing a little ways down. But I think that sign is a pretty good replacement, don't you think? Isuku looked where she was pointing and smiled in excitement as he saw Midoriya and Hatsume written down in big black letters. The girl holding the sign was only a few years older than them, but from the way she was holding herself, she definitely knew her way around. Mei didn't waste any time grabbing Isuku's hands and dragging him towards her. Come on, Izuku! Mei whined. The sooner we get out of this airport, the sooner we can start making babies! To his surprise, the girl picking them up didn't even blush at Mei's loud outburst. She just laughed. Oh, uh, you must be who I'm looking for. Uncle might mention that you two are a bit high energy. Now, which one of you is Hatsume and which one is Midoriya? I'm Midoriya, and this is Hatsume, Isuku introduced, keeping a tight hold on Mei's hand to keep her from leaping at their ride, which was a distinct possibility considering how her eyes were zooming in on every piece of potential tech that the girl was wearing, from her glasses to her earrings. Thank you so much for the opportunity to intern here. We're so excited to see everything that I Island has to offer. Are those tracking earrings? Mei interrupted. They've got microchips in them, but... Do they just track, or do they do something else as well, and... The girl laughed. <laughs> They're not trackers. They actually are a prototype that I'm working on for civilian support. I'm hoping to have them be an early warning sign for panic attacks. If I can tweak them just right, and maybe even help counteract them, but maybe you'll be able to help with that? May's eyes widened, and Ishika could practically feel her vibrating next to him. I will take that! You work in a lab, Mei. You don't need natural light. Isuku shook his head as Mei pulled them along, their ride following close behind them. And besides, you don't even know where the car is. We didn't even ask our ride her name. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I guess I forgot to introduce myself. The girl smiled kindly and skipped ahead so that she could stop in front of them, holding her hand out for a handshake. I'm Melissa Shields. Welcome to I Island. As always, if you enjoyed, feel free to leave a like or comment down below. I always love hearing from you guys. And make sure to subscribe so you can stay up to date with whenever I post. And to remember to hydrate, not dehydrate, and to love yourself. Now, on to my bloopers. I'm fairly certain that's why they don't allow them. Isuku pointed out. You do have a habit of blowing things up when you're making babies, Mei-chan. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> May's an unintentional terrorist. <laughs> and if she could just stop feeling like such an imposter. Sus? <laughs> Sorry.